Good morning, church. It's a beautiful day out. God has been good to us, even in our weather as of late. Um, let's be thankful for all He has done. Let's come before God together in time of worship. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your provision and guidance continually. Uh, we thank you that, God, we are given another day to just breathe in new air, breathe in new life. Thank you, Lord, that you have led us continually in your promise, in your grace, God. For sure, we don't deserve any of this, but we thank you that you love on us and you continue to um, show your love to us always. So, Lord, it is at this time our desire to come before you and just praise you for all you have done. Just praise and focus on you in this time. So, God, our one desire now is that you will help us touch our hearts, Lord, meet with us in this place. We love you, Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise God for all he has done, for all he is to us. Send me here in your presence, thinking of the good things you have done.
God, we thank you for taking us and molding us to become more like you, Lord. That we are not only depending on the things that we may know how to do, but God, because you are the one that makes us able. Lord, the things that which we could not ever imagine to do, because it may overwhelm us because of the circumstance that seems so much larger than who we are. God, now we are able to take that on in comfort because, God, we know that you are with us and that you are making us able. So, Lord, with this promise, with this thought, may our hearts dwell in your word here now. God, as we receive your word, may our hearts be ready to receive every single thing that you have to speak to us about. And may our heart not grow weary, not worry about anything, but may we find peace in your word of truth, in your words of promise. Thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm so glad to see you this morning, and I trust that you are in the best of health and ready to worship our Lord this morning. I really count it a privilege to share with you, even though I don't see you, but I long for the day that we will be together again in our sanctuary at CICC. Nonetheless, a very good morning. It's the merry month of May. Welcome to this first Sunday of the month. You know, perhaps like me, many of you are wondering when will this pandemic end because we want our lives to go back to normalcy. Well, we're not really sure when that time will be, but we know it will come. So I look around the internet for some memes concerning the stay-at-home order and how it's testing many of us. One of them that I found went something like this. After 15 days of stay at home, Robin Williams in Jumanji, long bearded one, he comes out and he says, what year is it? Not really sure what year it is. You know, Castaway's Tom Hanks, you would remember him, marooned in an island. And it says there, when you're a stay at home parent and each day seems to blur into the next, you wake up in the morning and you say, what day is it? And how long have I been here? A man on his morning walk, surprised by what he thought was an SOS message written on a driveway, he actually said this message on the driveway, save me from my kids. In an unsettling reversal of my teenage years, a teenager once said, but now an adult, I'm now yelling at my parents for going out. One meme said this, suddenly introverts are considered experts on the field of how to keep yourself from dying of boredom. Another one said, the side effect of quarantine is it's really hard to end the phone calls. Twice today I almost said, okay, I have to run before realizing there is nowhere to run to. Of course, one good thing about being in quarantine is the story of Rapunzel. You would remember her. Remember Rapunzel was in quarantine too, and she met her future husband. I want to say thank you to all of you for your generosity, because so many of you have come to my house in order to deliver some food. And I've been grateful for all of you for doing that. Perhaps among many of us in church, I am the most blessed because of all the food that comes to our door. You know, at this rate of generosity, by the time this pandemic is over, you could have a 400-pound senior pastor. Would you like that? I wouldn't. You know, the only thing getting thin around here is my patience. How is your patience quotient at this time? You know, there's a niche in the air to get out and enjoy the outdoors some more, isn't it? The end seems near, and yet it feels so far. Businesses want to open, get the economy going, but others are still hesitant. They are practicing patience. There's an open it, close it, ding-dong battle going on right now, and that's a good thing. It simply means that there are signs that the end is coming near, 
and soon we will go back to a place where we can go outdoors, go back to our jobs, but I may I say, things will not go back to what it used to be. So, we open the economy, that's a good thing, and then we hear about a second wave of a virus. We open the beaches and parks, we shut them down the next day. In other words, it's like we're limping towards the finish line. And times like these, is where patience gets tested. What is patience? For me, patience is the ability to remain in the moment's misery and then to resolve the moment's anxiety. There's two things about patience. Swindoll says it is waiting without worrying. Well, there's two things undoubtedly that happen in new but uncomfortable circumstances like an indefinite lockdown. First, there is the temptation to short-circuit the process and trespass, violate the orders, temptation. But secondly, there is also the tension that rises among close relations within the context of a home. What do we do when we're in this situation? What do we do when our patience wears thin. Well, if you have the letter of Paul to the Philippians in your Bible, there is actually something we learn concerning how we might handle patience. You see, Paul's letter to the Philippians has some striking similarities to today. Paul was in quarantine, staying at home. Well, he was actually under house arrest. Worse, he had bodyguards to ensure he would not get out of his home. Now Paul had a visitor sent by the Philippian church by the name of Epaphroditus. Can you see that name? Epaphroditus, a visitor from Philippi visiting the Apostle Paul in order to give Paul the donations that they have been doing for the sake of many who are in need. And so here is Epaphroditus delivering the funds that the church had collected, but somewhere along the way, things did not go as planned. Epaphroditus gets sick. Maybe when he visited Paul, he did not wear his mask on. Maybe he wasn't practicing social distancing. But whatever it is, Epaphroditus got sick, and the Philippian church got so concerned worried, quite impatient concerning Epaphroditus and his return to Philippi. So that's the background to the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Now, what I wanted to share with you this morning would be two things. The first, two postures when our patience is tested. Philippians 4 verse 1 goes like this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see my joy and crown, so stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. See, the first posture when patience is tested is this, stand firm. In other words, stay in the trenches. Stay where you are. See, the command to stand firm, that's used of soldiers, not just to stand in attention, but staying faithfully at their post, no matter what goes on around them. And so picture for yourself World War I and the military defensive strategy of staying in the trenches. Now it seems that the Philippian brethren were being tempted to break rank, get out of the trenches, because it's not easy to remain in the trenches day in and day out. Paul understands it's not easy to stay put when the bullets of temptation whiz by your heads. We'd be sorely tempted to leave our posts of faithfulness when the enemy approaches. In this situation, we need to be patient. We stay in the trenches. And what else do you do in isolation and quarantine? The second, we find in verse two, we need to settle our differences in the trenches. Stay in the trenches, but settle our differences. Verse two goes like this. I urge you, Odea, and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Verse 3, Indeed, true comrade, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel 
together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the Book of Life. Well, there's two things that I glean from these two verses. First, the best of friends suffer conflict. Two women are named in the letter. They are at war with each other. And to be named publicly in this letter, it implies there is no small conflict. And while we're not told of the substance of the conflict, it was so serious that Paul had to call it out. Now think about this. These women were strong role models and influencers in the church. Actually, they were gospel warriors with Paul. They struggled with Paul for the cause of the gospel. Gospel warriors. They were fellow workers with Paul. They were faithful worshipers with Paul. You know, those are the kinds of people you want as your BFFs. And they were, as far as Paul is concerned. Yet, they had conflict. You know, the most spiritual, the most committed, the most passionate for Christ have relational conflict. All the time. Consider it not a mystery, but consider it a ministry. Now, interestingly, Euodia, the name means sweet smell. And Syntyche means friendly. Think about that. Sweet smell and friendly. How ironic, sweet smell and friendly weren't very sweet or very friendly with each other. So you find the most committed ministry workers will have conflict with one another. The second thing I glean is this. The best of friends settle their conflict. See, Paul doesn't take sides here. Even handedly, he appeals to both of them to settle, resolve their conflict. He doesn't act as a mediator. He doesn't judge. He doesn't take sides. He doesn't even try to open the closet to find out what caused it. He simply appeals to their hearts on the basis of their shared relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, settle your difference. Live in harmony in the Lord. Live in harmony in the Lord. So, when you think about it, He's not talking about all the minutia. He's simply saying, make a personal choice to focus on the things that unite both of you in Christ. That's what you need to do. And so in quarantine, we're tempted to break ranks, but stay in the trenches. In quarantine, there's tension in the air with those you live with. Settle your differences. Now, Paul continues on with very practical advice concerning our patience quotient. Instead of working up your PQ or patience quotient, which seldom works, here's what Paul seeks to do. He actually texts his strategy, short message texting, building up your IQ. And what he says is basically this. Take your mind off the idea of patience and work hands with these patience drills. Here's what you do, he says. Five practices, five guardians of patience, protectors of patience. Number one, he says, let your gladness be ever present. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice, verse four. You know, we rejoice not because we're enjoying how hard the times are. You know, that makes us a sadist or a masochist. Our gladness is not in our circumstances. Our gladness is in the Lord. In other words, we bring the Lord in each of our circumstances because that is the only way we can be happy in any situation, when the Lord is there with us. Our consistent and perpetual attitude is one of joy when the Lord is in it. And so we rejoice in the Lord when we are in tension, in anxiety. We bring the Lord in and we rejoice in the Lord in that circumstance. You know how ironic today, because men think that they find their greatest happinesses when the Lord is not with them. I mean, he's deliberately absent in the jokes and the conversations. Don't bring him in. 
he's a killjoy. Isn't that the way we think? The truth is, we get into trials, we get into tensions and temptations because we leave him out. Rejoice in the Lord. Bring the Lord in, in whatever circumstance. Rejoice in him. That is the only way. In him we rejoice, so take him with you in your most anxious of relationships. Rejoice in the Lord. Second thing, second practice, Paul says, let your gentleness be evident. Verse 5, let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Now, there's two things I want to mention here. The first is the matter of personhood. You know, the word gentle or forbearance, that is a difficult word to translate in English. The best I found is a phrase, non-anxious presence. Let your non-anxious presence be known to all men. You know, it's a gentle demeanor in moments when your muscles begin to tense up, when your blood rushes, and when you want to strike back in order to defend yourself, to lash out, to speak your mind with vitriol. Oh, you do feel the tensing up inside. There's no denying what you feel. But you're able, by God's spirit of gentleness, to remain calm. You see, let that kind of air in you be visible. Such a gentle spirit will do much to disarm your adversary. Let your gentleness be evident. It's a matter of who you are, person, gift of the Holy Spirit, gentleness. But it's also a matter of perspective. It says here by Paul, suddenly he writes down, the Lord is near. What does that mean? Perspective. See, the other way to make this work in your deep heart is a matter of perspective, this calmness. Think about the finish line of life. Christ is coming back, and he is coming back very, very soon. And he will make all things right. And so his coming is soon, it is near. And because he is coming soon, the finish line is close. That levels everything, doesn't it? That kind of hope puts springs on my steps, a swagger on my stride. Christ is coming back. He is near. He is coming again. And so the third thing Paul says, not only let your gladness be ever present, let your gentleness be evident, but number three, let your worries be absent. Be anxious for nothing, verse 6. Now, Paul is not talking about matters of concern. We are concerned about many things, and that's a good thing. But he's talking about anxiety. You know, the fretfulness, the undue concern that comes with worrying. And so he's not calling for apathy or inaction either. He is simply saying such burdensome nagging, burdensome worrying that cause ulcers on you should be thrown into the rubbish bin, the trash can. That's where anxiety needs to belong. Let your worries be absent. And then he continues on in verse 6. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You see, the fourth thing Paul says you practice to protect and guard your patience is this. Let your prayers be diligent. You see, there is every tinge of pressure. What causes you to worry? Every big and little thing that may trigger an anxiety trigger a palpitation, a red face, a tensed muscle, take everything to prayer. But you see, it's not just pray about these pressures, but making the pressure in your life, making worry and anxiety the occasion to pray. When you're anxious, pray. When you worry, pray. In everything, 
in every tinge of pressure, pray. And he says, not only in everything do we pray, but he says, in every type of praying, bring these all to God in every type of praying. Prayers, supplication, thanksgiving, requests, four words concerning prayer. Prayer is coming to the Father who knows, the Father who cares, the Father who gives. And supplication is the expression of our need. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. Lord, I need your peace. Lord, I need food. Lord, I need provision. When we come to the Father, we supplicate. Lord, supply my needs according to your promises. That's supplication. Thanksgiving is the firm trust that whatever God sends is for our good. Whatever he sends is for our good. We look forward and we say thanks, even though we haven't received them yet, but in full trust with our God. And so requests refers to all that we ask. Every type of prayer we employ in diligence. And so when we pray, we bring in all these kinds of prayers because we know God will answer and it is actually a guardian to our patience. And every time we do, Paul says, there is a promise. Every time, a promise. There will be a peace that is not easily explained by earthlings. This sense of serenity is like living beside the strongest, the cleanest, and the alertest police station or a military camp right beside you. You know how safe and secure that is? When your house is right beside the strongest, the cleanest, and the alertest police station? Zero crime. Unless, of course, it's the police that commits the crime. But that's not going to happen here. And so the peace of God is like that. The peace of God garrisons your heart and your mind. It guards your heart and mind as if to say, hey, anxiety, hey, worry, hey, stress, you're not allowed inside. We are guardians of this person's patience. And so heart and mind is the place where all agitations, our fears, our worries, our anxieties, our panic, all our pranings, these are where it attacks us, heart and mind. That place heavily guarded by the peace of God when we, Pray. You see, when you have that kind of peace deep within your heart, patience comes next. Love, joy, peace, patience, remember? Fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so we have four practices. Number one, let your gladness be ever present. Number two, let your gentleness be evident. Number three, let your anxiety be absent and number four let your prayers be diligent now at the fifth let your outlook be excellent verse 8 finally brethren whatever is true whatever is honorable whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is of good repute if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise let your mind dwell on these things. Verse 9, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. Two things again that I bring to your attention concerning having a lookout that is excellent. We need to center our minds on excellence. See these words, true, whatever is true, whatever is honest, whatever is reliable, Honorable, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is right, that is, whatever aligns with God's standards, whatever is pure, that is moral cleanness, whatever is lovely, whatever is pleasing, like these flowers all around me, whatever is pleasing, whatever is of good repute, what brings true of the highest standards. Paul says, let your thoughts live in this environment of excellence. Center your mind on excellence. Focus on excellent things. That's the first. The second thing he says concerning our outlook is this. Copy your mentor's example. See, the word here, practice these things. That word practice simply means praxis, drills, 
things you do in order to be disciplined. It means an application, not so much a theory. You put flesh to it. It's actually Discipleship 101. What is the content of our application? That's the question. You see the first pair of words? Learned and received from me, Paul says. That refers to the mentor's instruction. Are you listening to this preaching? Are you listening to teaching? Are you attending a Bible study? Are you in a Sunday school class? Are you in an oikos group? Are you part of a prayer corner? You see, you get instructed in these arenas of faith. Heard and seen, you see it in your mentor's integrity. And so it's not simply your mentor's instruction, but your mentor's integrity. You hear it from him or her, and you see it from him or her. That is character and conduct merging together in the person. The content of the person, the walk of the person, they all align because of God's word. A man or a woman of integrity, Paul says, practice these things. What you see, what you've heard, what you've learned, what you've received from your mentors, copy them in your life. You see, you not only learn from him or his content, but you actually mimic the character and the conduct of your mentors. What you hear him say is what you see him do. Now do it yourself. Let your outlook be excellent. Centering your mind on excellence, copying your mentor's example. You know, I read somewhere that an average person has 10,000 distinct thoughts each day. 10,000 each day. Distinct, that is unique. That's 3.5 million thoughts a year. And if you live to 75 years old, you will have 270 million unique thoughts. And so maybe today, since you woke up this morning, maybe you would have had a thousand unique thoughts already, unless you're still in bed and trying to listen to the sermon. You know, you have probably 9,000 more thoughts before you crash in your bed tonight. And then tomorrow, you start all over again. You fill your minds with good, loving, pleasing, virtuous, excellent thoughts. You follow your mentor's life. Somebody said, do you know what the secret to patience is? The secret of patience is doing something else in the meantime. And so when you want your patience quotient to increase, don't think about patience. Think about these five practices, five guardians. Let your rejoicing and gladness be ever present in your life. Let your gentleness be evident. Let anxiety be absent. Let your prayers be diligent. Let your outlook be excellent. Patience will be protected. Patience will grow. A mentor sent me a WhatsApp text just a few days ago. It's actually a video in YouTube. It's called Social Distance Sing Project. Have you heard of that? The Longest Time. Oh, you know that song very well. Oh, for the longest time. You know that song, right? Well, it goes like this. I have been at home in quarantine, stopping spread of COVID-19. What else could I do? Don't want this virus from you? I haven't left here for the longest time. Funny, isn't it? But it gives us hope. Makes light of our situation. We can be glad because we rejoice in the Lord each time. Patience, doing something else in the meantime. Patience is all about waiting for God. But waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort at all. But waiting for God means, first, activity under command. Secondly, readiness for any new command that may come. And third, the ability to do nothing 
until the command is given. Patient quotient. Guard it with these five drills in your life. You can do it. You can stand and stay firm in the trenches. You can settle your differences because the Lord is with you. The finish line is about to come. We're almost there. Stay and remain in the trenches. Resolve your differences. And the God of peace shall be with you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much that we can bring your word into our situation today. Help us, we pray, when we tense up in a moment's misery. And yet, Lord, we need you in those moments. And so help us not only to enjoy our moments with one another, but to understand you've got a plan. You're near us and you're teaching us so many valuable things. And so even in waiting, we know we are growing in strength. We're developing character. And even as we wait for the finish line, we know that sometimes the greatest gifts are in the waiting and not on the end, but right here with us now. And so thank you, Lord Jesus, that your presence goes with us. And I pray for those who have moments of impatience in this situation. I pray that you calm their hearts. I pray that you teach them these instructions so that indeed they might reflect the glory of God in whatever circumstance they face. Thank you, Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I have some announcements for us, church several things that are going on please remain because we have lord's supper to be celebrated together by zoom and so if you are not in zoom please contact any of your pastors contact any of your oikos coordinators they will connect you to our zoom togetherness in a short while the second thing whenever you enter your zoom meeting we have a request for you can you please change the ID of your Zoom? Change it to your name if you haven't done so. It's important for us who host the Zoom meeting to know who it is that's coming in, being admitted to a Zoom meeting. And sometimes the ID you might have simply says iPhone or iPad. We don't know who you are. And we want to secure our meeting so that there is no hacking, nobody interrupts, nobody comes in who is a stranger and just messes up our meeting. And so could you change the ID, put your name in there so we recognize you. There is a cross-cultural parenting seminar at four o'clock this afternoon. If you want to be a part of that, you have an elementary, high school kid, please join this parenting seminar at four o'clock. Also by Zoom, contact your pastors if you want to join that seminar. Thirdly, very important reminder or announcement, we have a service project for our community that is starting on Wednesday. We call it the Meals on Wheels Service Project. We're gonna appreciate, support, pray, affirm all the frontliners who are risking their lives in order to serve others who might be at the forefront of the battle against the COVID-19. We're preparing meals for them and our desire is that we might be able to prepare around 200 meal packs for the frontliners around our community. Would you join us? Because we need volunteers, cooks. We need people to handle the food and prepare them in packages. We need deliverers. We need drivers. We need greeters. We need prayer warriors. Please volunteer. Call any of your pastors or Romy Robles. Call each one of us and say, I'm willing to volunteer. Please come. Wednesday in church. We need more cooks, and so please come. We also need money, and so I pray that you will join the Oikos group, the challenge to sponsor, sponsor a hundred dollars worth of meals, all of you as one Oikos, not a hundred dollars each, but the whole Oikos group to come up with a hundred dollars. That's a challenge to sponsor the frontliners. Fourthly, next Sunday, guess what it is? Mother's Day, you might have forgotten. 
Make sure you gather around your mothers because we have a special treat, tribute for our mothers next Sunday. Following Monday, May 11, we're going to have a small groups facilitators training. And so I hope if you are a small group training or facilitator, a coordinator, and you need training, come join the training event. And so here we are. I pray that you receive the Lord's blessings as we close in prayer. Father, thank you again that you seek to bless us. And so, Lord, would your presence go with each one of us from now on until we meet again. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you.